You know, I've always been curious about something. Why does a grilled steak taste so different from a boiled one? Hmm, that's a meaty question, Chloe. I think it's all about the different cooking techniques involved, right? Precisely, Evelyn. And that's what we're going to dive into in this episode. The mystery of cooking techniques and how they color our experiences with food. From the sizzle of a grill to the bubbling of a boil, everything creates a distinct food symphony. I love that image, Chloe. Our listeners must be feeling pretty curious, too. So let's not keep them hanging. Let's explore the world of cooking techniques together. Definitely, Evelyn, we should. We need to understand more. Why does grilling give a deep, smoky flavor while boiling won't? What's the story behind it? Great questions. And I guess the answer lies in the dance between heat, moisture, and flavors. So buckle up, listeners, because we are going on a flavor roller coaster. This is going to be a deliciously insightful episode. Okay, Evelyn, let's start with the basics. We've got four primary cooking techniques that I think are great starters. Boiling, grilling, steaming, and roasting. Can we start with roasting? Sure, roasting is a fantastic technique. Having grown up in China, roasting wasn't that common. We primarily steamed and boiled most food items. But the beauty of roasting is that it uses dry heat to cook the food, which often results in a browned, often crunchy exterior and a moist, flavorful interior. That's interesting to know, especially considering how roasting is a popular technique in Western cuisine. It tends to bring out a depth of flavor in vegetables that simple boiling or steaming can't match. But I'm curious, Evelyn, you mentioned boiling. Is that a technique you use often? Yes, you're right, Chloe. In Asian cooking, boiling is such a basic technique, yet also very complex. It's not only about tossing veggies into boiling water. We use it for simmering sauces, making soups, and even for brewing teas. Brewing tea? That absolutely counts. In America, we also boil to make hearty soups and stews, especially during winter. Let's move on to grilling, the American favorite. The char marks, smoky flavor. It's hard not to fall in love with it. Sure, Chloe. I've learned about grilling later in my life. We didn't use it much in China, but I've come to adore the smoky, caramelized flavors. It's similar to roasting, but the heat source is below, and the food is usually open to the air, right? Exactly. Finally, let's touch on steaming, something very common in Asian cuisines, especially for fish and dumplings. We often use bamboo steamers to cook food by using the heat of steam, thus keeping their nutritional properties mostly intact. A gentle, health-conscious method. Steaming surely does seem like a unique method, Evelyn. It is used for some veggies here, too, but clearly we have so much more to explore. So, Evelyn, I've always found it fascinating how the same raw ingredient can transform so drastically through different cooking methods. Why don't we unpack this a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a simple chicken breast as an example. If you grill it, you get this irresistible, smoky exterior. Those grill marks are actually a result of the Maillard reaction, where sugars and proteins in the meat break down to create new flavors and a distinct color. Ah, the Maillard reaction. I remember that from my science classes. So that's what gives grilled chicken that unique taste and appealing look. And what if we boil the same chicken breast? Boiling might not be as glamorous as grilling, but it has its own perks. Boiling is all about moisture. The chicken cooks in warm water, making the meat tender, but it won't have that tasty, caramelized surface. Now, while it's a more subtle flavor compared to grilling, it's great for dishes where the chicken isn't the only star, like in soups or stews. That makes sense. And with roasting the chicken, we would see a different outcome, right? Absolutely, Chloe. Roasting uses dry, indirect heat. That beautiful golden brown color, that's the oven's superheated air helping sugars caramelize on the surface. And the inside, with its moist and tender meat, owes its texture to the even heat distribution in an oven. It's amazing how a single ingredient can provide such diverse results, simply due to the cooking method. So each technique adds its own unique value? Couldn't have put it better myself. It's all about how the technique can alter texture and flavor. So, our listeners out there, which method do you use the most and why? So speaking of grilling, it's a common belief, Evelyn, that many think grilling is all about those lovely sear marks and the smoky flavor. But there's more than meets the eye. The heat from the grill can cause meats to lose moisture and become tougher in texture. But the high heat also means the proteins undergo the Maillard reaction faster, which leads to the appealing brown crust and smoky flavor we love in a grilled steak. 
Oh, the Maillard reaction. That's when amino acids and reducing sugars in the food react under heat, isn't it? It's fascinating that this reaction, while giving that appetizing appearance and flavor, can actually make the meat a bit tougher. But if you're aiming for that smoky, savory flavor, grilling is your go-to method. Exactly, Evelyn. Now, on the other hand, boiling food is another technique, one which is often misunderstood. While it's true that some nutrients can be lost in boiling water, certain foods, like vegetables, can actually benefit from this process. The heat and water can help break down the cell walls, making nutrients more available. That's interesting, Chloe. And not to forget, boiling is necessary in creating mixers for cocktails. To make a simple syrup, for instance, we usually dissolve sugar in boiling water. It's straightforward, but efficient. As a mixologist, I use this method frequently when creating homemade syrups and juices for cocktails. I never thought about boiling from a cocktail perspective. It seems these techniques bring their own twist to what we're cooking, or in your case, mixing. This makes it more intriguing to experiment with these methods. Chloe, you know, speaking of grilling, I remembered a funny thing while I was working in the States. Even though it's originally from South America, grilling really does have a special place in American culture. It's like a symbol of home, family, and festivity all rolled into one. That's true. My family, like many others, has a tradition of backyard barbecues in the summer. The smell of grilled burgers and corn brings back memories of family laughter and neighborhood camaraderie. I think that's what's great about cooking techniques. They are embedded not just in the food, but also in our cultural memories. Absolutely, and I have found the same to be true with steaming in many Asian cultures. Steamed dishes like baozi, dumplings, or zongzi have a special place in festivals and home dinners alike. But steaming isn't as simple as it may appear to be. There's a lot of science behind it, and some unique techniques are employed in Asian cuisines that are not seen elsewhere. For example, have you heard of bamboo steaming? I can't say I have, Evelyn. What is it? Well, bamboo steaming is a technique prevalent in Chinese and other Asian cultures, primarily because of the availability of bamboo. Steam dishes are cooked in bamboo baskets, stacked one above the other, over boiling water. This method gives a slight bamboo fragrance to the food, and it's really efficient for cooking larger amounts of food. Whoa, bamboo steaming, huh? I'd love to try that sometime. It's fascinating how the choice of a cooking technique can really transform the flavors and also craft unique culinary experiences. Exactly! And I think that's what we want to highlight through this podcast, the magic of these techniques and how they change our perception of food. It's a journey that's both cultural and personal, as we just shared. All right, brace yourselves as we dust off our aprons for a quick live cooking demo using these techniques. First up, boiling. We know it might sound simple, but remember, it's all about timing. Just like making my perfect simple syrup for cocktails, it's all about dissolving the sugars thoroughly without burning them. I'll admit, that's a technique that's criminally underrated. Now, let's jump to roasting, shall we? I find roasting vegetables to be a game changer. It draws out their natural sugars, giving them a caramelized, earthy flavor. For instance, if you're roasting carrots, first, oil them lightly, sprinkle some rosemary, thyme, salt, pepper, and into the oven they go. Monitor it closely, though. You don't want them charred. So true. I find roasting affects the color, too, making it more vibrant. Now, let's dive into grilling Ever wondered why that grilled steak has a distinctive umami smack compared to a boiled one? Well, it's all thanks to something called the Maillard reaction. Exactly. And for all you curious minds out there, the Maillard reaction is a chemical reaction between an amino acid and a reducing sugar. This gives browned food its distinctive flavor. It's named after French chemist Louis-Camille Maillard, who first described it in the 1910s while attempting to reproduce biological protein synthesis. But we're digressing. And lastly, steaming, the silent warrior in the kitchen. Interesting fact, did you know bamboo steaming originated from specific Asian cultures? It adds a subtle bamboo fragrance to the food. When I prepare rice or dumplings, I use a bamboo steamer, steam rises and cooks the food while absorbing that sweet bamboo aroma. Plus, it's a healthier option compared to others. These techniques stretch beyond our usual kitchen routine, don't they? I bet our listeners got some great foodie inspiration right there. All right, I'm going to break down this roasting process a bit more. One of the key things about roasting is the dry heat. 
Oven roasting, for instance, involves cooking food uncovered. The hot air seals the outside of the food, which is what traps the moisture inside, leading to that juicy interior we all crave. Sounds delicious already, but what about the temperature? I assume that plays a significant role, too. Exactly, Evelyn. For a standard oven roast, you'd be looking at about 375 de Gragfin. But again, it depends on what you're cooking. Root veggies? They need a higher temperature because they're tougher. But delicate veggies, like bell peppers or zucchini, would need a bit less. Also, a little tip I picked up. Try tossing them in some sort of fat like olive oil before roasting. It helps the heat transfer more evenly, accelerating the cooking process. Interesting. I'll definitely keep those tips in mind next time I roast. Now let's talk about bamboo steaming. This common Asian technique is rather meditative, if you ask me. For beginners, all you need is a bamboo steamer, a pot, and a lid. The key idea is to allow the steam to cook the food. Hmm, I guess the process seems pretty straightforward. But I can't help wondering... Doesn't that mean the food comes out rather bland? Ah, a common misconception. Though it's true that steaming is a gentler method of cooking, it actually helps to retain more of the food's natural flavor compared to, say, boiling. When it comes to bamboo steaming, the trick is in the preparation of the ingredients and the dipping sauces you prepare to accompany the steamed food. It's all about how those layers of flavors come together. So it's more about the art of blending flavors than the complexity of the method. I guess there's more to these techniques than meets the eye. Now the best part, trying it. Who's ready to roast some veggies or steam some dumplings? You can do it. Absolutely, Evelyn. There's no better way to learn than by doing. Listeners, if you're following along with us, make sure your oven or steamer is ready. And remember, there's no such thing as a silly question or mistake. Every chef learns from mishaps in the kitchen. Use those as learning opportunities. That's a really good reminder, Evelyn. Perhaps we could take a few audience questions now. Let's see what's on their minds. Here's one from Mike in Texas. Evelyn, you said steaming retains more of the food's natural flavor, but how can I add more flavor to my steamed veggies? They often come out bland. Great question, Mike. Well, there are two things you can do. First, make sure to season your veggies before steaming. Salt and pepper work great, but feel free to experiment with spices. Secondly, you can flavor the water you're using for steaming. Adding a splash of wine or broth can make a big difference. That is fascinating, Evelyn. Never considered adding flavor to steam water. Sarah from UK asks, Chloe, you mentioned the importance of using some sort of fat, like olive oil, for roasting. Why is that? Well, oil acts as a heat conductor. It helps distribute heat more evenly across the surface of the food, ensuring it cooks evenly. But remember... A little goes a long way. Evelyn, I've noticed that a grilled steak in America tastes so much different than a skewered lamb kebab in Morocco. Even though they're both grilled, they are worlds apart in flavor. Isn't it fascinating to think about how regional influences shape cooking methods? Yes, Chloe. Different cultures utilize heat and cooking methods in such a unique way that it gives their food an identifiable taste. Take steaming, for instance a technique I've seen being used extensively in Asia. Just by changing the ingredients that are used with steam, like aromatic herbs or broth, you can bring out different flavors in the food. Can you think of a Western parallel, perhaps? Hmm, a Western cooking method. Roasting comes to mind. In America, we tend to roast meats and vegetables, often carefully spiced or marinated. And this method gives the food that quintessentially hearty, comfort food flavor we associate with home, but every culture has its own version, right? Absolutely. Korea, for instance, also has a technique similar to roasting called gogigui, or Korean BBQ, where meat is cooked on gridirons or perforated dome griddles over charcoal. The fat dripping onto the coals creates this incredible smoky flavor that is so different from American roasting. These cooking methods really are a feature of our cultural fingerprint. Oh, how I'd love to try some gogigui. It sounds like an intriguing blend of techniques. I'm also thinking about boiling, which seems so basic, and yet varies so much across cultures. We may use it in America to make hearty stews, while in other places it's used for teas, broths, or even pudding. That's so true and pretty cool, actually. In France, boiling is used for making delicate sauces and extracting flavors for stocks, whereas in China it's often used for making soups and congees. So even with something as basic as boiling, 
there's a cultural twist. It all comes down to what we add to that pot of boiling water. So at the end of the day, it's not just the method, but how and why it's used that really distinguishes one culture's cuisine from another's. It's that distinctive combination of ingredients, preparation, and cooking technique that forms a recipe for a culinary journey around the world. On a typical day in Seoul, one could step into a buzzing street food market and watch enthralled as a vendor fans the flames under bulgogi. It's a traditional grilling method that's been passed down generations. But step into a contemporary Korean fine dining restaurant, they'll be grilling over a sous vide machine. Hmm, fascinating. And I've heard that Korea's traditional barbecue style, the gogi gai you mentioned earlier, has even been modernized with newfangled grills and all sorts of marinating techniques. Now, it's more than just a way to cook food. It's an entire experience. Exactly, Chloe. And burrowing into the kernels of your culture, America has amplified their grilling techniques with technology and changing dietary preferences. But let's not limit ourselves to grilling. What about the transformation of roasting across the globe? That's an ergonomic path to choose, Evelyn. Bear with me on this. In America, we typically roast our Thanksgiving turkeys in the oven, basting them with butter for that beautiful golden color. Outside of the kitchen, the industrialization of food has fostered rotisserie, roasting methods, where the meat is continuously rotated for uniform cooking. Indeed, and in China, they roast meats over fire or in deep ovens, which gives the food this beautiful caramelization and a specific smoky flavor. The same method of roasting has also been customizable in creating Beijing's iconic dish, Peking duck. I would love to taste a Peking duck one day. So, we're summarizing that while traditional methods have their own unique flavors and textures, the introduction of new methods has led to a fusion of taste that's being embraced worldwide. But Eva, when we're grilling or roasting, what chemical transformation is happening that leads to these tantalizing changes? Ah, Chloe, you've hit upon the beautiful paradox of cooking, where tasty magic is spun from cold, hard science. Whenever we apply heat to food, myriads of reactions are triggered. Going technical here, it's called the Maillard reaction, where amino acids and reducing sugars present in food interact under heat to produce new flavors and aromas. All the browning we see during roasting, grilling, or baking, that's the Maillard reaction at work. So, no Maillard, no magic. But let's swirl this around a bit. Boiling doesn't quite produce those heavenly smells. Can we explain that? Absolutely, Chloe. The reason is pretty simple. Boiling involves water and is usually done at a temperature below what's needed for the Maillard reaction to occur. So even though boiling helps in cooking food, we don't see browning or those lovely aromatics. It's like having two sides of the coin with flavor. On one hand, we've got the rich, caramelized goodness that techniques like roasting and grilling produce. And then there's the delicate simmering of boiling, all thanks to intricate science in action. Well put, Chloe. Every method is unique and has its place, depending on the result you're craving. Besides these, there are other fairly complex reactions like caramelization, enzymatic browning, or even the fatty acids breaking down in fats giving rise to the crispy exterior of free-ed foods. It's a fascinating world of chemistry on our plates every day. And here I was thinking cooking was an art. Turns out it's an interplay between the artist and the scientist inside us. So you're saying there would be no fudge brownie without amino acids and reducing sugars getting cozy in the oven. Exactly, Chloe. It's like every dish we savor is a delicious chemical reaction served on a platter. Speaking of chemistry and cooking, have you ever heard of molecular gastronomy? Fancy words. Didn't that fancy cooking technique become all the rage during the late 2000s? Like pulling carrot foam out of a sous vide bag or making caviar out of olive oil? Haha. <laughs> yes, Chloe. Molecular gastronomy indeed is a term many people associate with chefs in white lab coats creating fog from dry ice, but it's so much more. Really? Sounds mysterious and fascinating, but also confusing. Can you simplify it for our listeners and me? I'll give it a shot. So, in a nutshell, molecular gastronomy is the art and science of cooking. It explores how ingredients change when we cook them under various conditions. It's about examining and experimenting with the physical and chemical transformations of ingredients while cooking. Are there any chefs known for this kind of cooking apart from the ones in TV shows? Oh yes, plenty. 
For instance, Ferran Adria, the Spanish chef known for his avant-garde approach at El Bulli, is often credited with popularizing molecular gastronomy. Can you give an example where this new discipline has taken traditional cooking techniques to a whole new level? Let's think. How about spherification? A process where liquid is turned into spheres that pop in your mouth, releasing bursts of flavor from within. Like the boba and bubble tea. Sounds like edible science experiments. Precisely. It's about creativity, innovation, and pushing the boundaries of what we traditionally perceive as cooking. Remember when we grilled those steaks at the last barbecue, Evelyn? Packed with flavors, right? All thanks to some basic cooking techniques. Exactly. What if we revisit those techniques with some of our favorite recipes? That sounds exciting. What's your first pick, Chloe? I'll go with a simple one, roasted vegetables, a recipe I swear by. The roasting technique drives out moisture and caramelizes natural sugars, bringing out intense flavor and crispiness. What's your secret there? How to get that perfect caramelization? It's all about temperature control. High heat helps the vegetables develop that beautiful brown caramelization and maintains a crisp texture. I usually go for around 425 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to achieve the caramelizing and tenderizing effects without scorching the veggies. Impressive! My next pick is for all seafood lovers out there. Poaching, a commonly underestimated technique. I've been enjoying poached salmon lately. It's about gently cooking the salmon in a heated liquid to preserve its delicate texture. Poaching salmon? That sounds like a fancy restaurant dish. Do you need special equipment for that? Simple, really. A skillet or a shallow pan that can hold the fish and enough liquid to cover it. That's pretty much all you need. I see this as mechanically simpler than grilling or roasting. The real key lies within the controlled temperature at which the liquid is kept, right? You've got it, Chloe. Always remember, poaching is never about boiling. That's the golden rule. It's a gentle cooking process that allows the salmon to cook evenly while preserving its flavor and moisture. So, listeners, we're hoping you're inspired to try these techniques in your kitchen. Imagine roasting your veggies for an unexpected depth of flavor. And that salmon? Once you've poached it, you'll be surprised how it transforms in texture. Just remember to keep the heat gentle. You're not boiling it, just simmering it. Exactly. And remember that these techniques aren't reserved just for our selections today. Apply the boiling to your pasta or use the grilling for your chicken. There's a whole world of taste and texture out there that different methods can unlock. Right, and the fun part is experimenting. Swap roasting for grilling or try steaming instead of boiling. That's when you really get to know your ingredients and gain control over your flavors. And honestly, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Sometimes they can lead to great discoveries. Who knows, you might invent your own cooking method. Oh, I can't wait to hear about those. Do share your outcomes, your wins, and even your funny kitchen blunders. What an exhilarating exploration of cooking techniques, right, Evelyn? I've never had so much fun dissecting a topic, Chloe. We've played with fire, heat, steam, and even science. It's interesting how simply changing a technique can make your food experience so much more exciting. That was the real eye-opener. You know, the science bit of why boiling or grilling can fundamentally transform a dish was something new to me. But knowing it, I'm really looking forward to exploring newer techniques. I can't wait to see how you incorporate the Asian steaming techniques into your kitchen, Chloe. And listeners, we can't express how excited we are for you to try these methods. Imagine a dinner with grilled appetizers, steamed dumplings, and a perfectly roasted chicken. We can almost taste it. I love how this isn't just about changing the way we cook, but also about understanding the world around us. Right from our food plate to our kitchen. If you guys at home are half as excited as Evelyn and I are, then we can confidently say, you're in for a treat, literally. Absolutely. And let's remember, whether we're talking steaming or searing, it's all about finding joy in cooking. So go out there, give these techniques a whirl, and remember to share your culinary adventures with us. Do that. But also remember to stay patient and don't fret over mistakes. Cooking is an art and science, but it's also a journey of discovery. So here's to exploring those flavors, textures, and the joy of cooking with your heart and soul. See you next week, and until then, keep experimenting. And keep tasting. There's a world of taste and texture out there. Thank you all for joining us in the Late Night Kitchen. We are excited for all the fun culinary escapades that lie ahead. So until our next delicious rendezvous, eat well and cook with love. <laughs>